it for the, for the morning session is Tiffany Thornhill, who has a fantastic title that uh, is better to type than to say, The Wonderful World of Waiting Birds in the Water. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so I work really closely with Kathleen um, on crew on various monitoring uh, projects. Um, today, in the spirit of sharing ideas and things that we've tried and failed, um, I'm really going to talk mostly about the protocols that we use because this, for us, I think we've nailed it. I think we've actually found something that really works really well. So, yeah, that's going to be okay. <laughs> All right, okay. So, um, waiting bird surveys by plane, why even do it? Um, well, first of all, we wanted to know if there were any nesting colonies on crew. Um, so locating nesting colonies and foraging groups and roosting groups, that was really important. And then once we find them, monitoring those groups to see how they're changing. Are they increasing? Are they decreasing? Part of knowing where they are and what they're doing and how well they're doing is to inform land management. What types of habitats are we finding them in? Um, do we have enough of those habitats? What do we need to do to make them better for waiting birds? So, how are we doing it? Huh. <laughs> um, we have about two people besides the pilot. Pilot flies, we look. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen takes pictures, she's on one side. I'm on the other side and I look through binoculars and say, yeah, I think those are great egrets. Um, so <laughs> we fly in a Cessna. We have 11 transects. They're about 0.8 nautical miles apart. Um, they go over the whole watershed. Um, crew here is in various shades of green. So we have, um, this is, is Flint Pen Strand. This is Burger Free Swamp. This is a Corkscrew Marsh. And the blue are Conservation Collier areas. So this is um, Care Care Prairie Preserve. This is Pepper Ranch, and then the big pink block in the middle is the sanctuary. So, because in order to cover our areas, we would have to fly over um, the sanctuary anyway, we count birds found there too. Um, so yeah, I, I'm probably forgetting something, but hopefully not. So, that's the mechanics of going up there, flying and circling and counting. When we find something, we take a GPS point, um, and we will note on our data sheets, you know, whether we think it's nesting, roosting, foraging. And then we circle. <laughs> so as we fly the transects, we keep, we keep it at about 800 feet in altitude. Um, when we find something, we bring it down to 500 feet and we circle closely. Um, try to get some better photos. And we've tried different cameras, different lenses, different settings on the cameras to figure out exactly how to do it. And Kathleen could probably talk more about how we nailed that. Um, the waiting birds. So once we get all of those photos back, um, and we have literally hundreds of photos per, per flight, then I go through them, I use Adobe Photoshop Elements 9, and I pick the photos that are, you know, going to get all of the birds in the colony. I mark each bird as counted with a specific color per species. So I'm actually going to go into this a little bit more because I think it's really important. Um, the data that we get, I think it's pretty rock solid, pretty good, and it's very meticulous. So this is something <laughs> that after trial and error we discovered was easier for the person counting the photos, which is me. <laughs> um, this is um, an overview shot of, of a typical nesting colony. Um, this is actually what we called subcolony one, and it was here on the sanctuary. Um, and these are all wood storks nesting. What these squares are um, represent individual photos. So the overview shot is a wider angle of the entire colony. Then as we're circling, we zoom in and try to get better, closer up shots of the birds that make it easier for me to count. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna go to this picture first, it's image 6480. Um, there's a, a group of birds here in this tree, and then over here there's a snag, and there's two birds in there. All right, so <laughs> it's a very different angle. You're zoomed in, 
Um, but keep in mind, I have like hundreds of photos <laughs> taken very closely together. So I can almost follow um, the way the plane went around these colonies and track them. Um, so I picked these. The green means that these are wood storks. Um, the bees are branchlings. This is an adult beside a nest with two nestlings in it. This has one nestling in that nest. These are, they're just hanging out, so they just have dots beside them. So, hard to say, but yes, that's what you're looking at. <laughs> um, I'm gonna um, quickly go to how I use this method to make sure I'm not double counting. So the next photo I'm gonna go to is, is this one, 6470. There's a group here, and then there's a snag here, and there's some birds on this um, big dead tree. Okay, so again, <laughs> looks totally different. You're zoomed in. But, but I can get a better look. And when I'm in Photoshop, I can zoom in closer, zoom out, um, and I can nicely mark these. Um, you know, originally we started doing this in Picasso. Jean, did you try Picasso? I ended up using paint. Paint, okay. <laughs> that must be even harder. <laughs> it's, a it's a nightmare. But Photoshop Elements makes this fast and much easier. So here's the snag here with the birds on it. I've got ibis marked in peach and all the other ones are wood storks, they're in green. So that's that one. Now over here, you can see that there's maybe three wood storks in that tree, and it slightly overlaps with the picture that we just looked at. So these are those three wood storks in that tree, and these are the birds that were on that snag. By using Photoshop, <laughs> I can put the, a block over that. And I can say, I already counted those, and I can mark the image. So every photo has a data sheet. This data sheet would count three wood storks, not those, not those at all. The really cool thing about this is that because I have that overview shot, I can make sure I'm counting everything there. Because I can take care to not double count, because I can mark the ones I've already counted in another photo, I'm not double counting. So, we feel really good about our data. <laughs> the other really good thing about this is neither one of us were waiting bird experts. So if we had to rely on being up in the air and making judgment calls about what we were seeing and counting it, I was not comfortable with that. Kathleen was not comfortable with that. This way, you don't have to be an expert. You can come back, take your time, look through the photos, mark it down, and be really confident with your data. And anybody else can go back through my photos and my data sheets and check my work. So you don't have to take my word for it. <laughs> if you really want to, <laughs> you can count them yourself. <laughs> um, okay, so what do we do with the numbers? Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the numbers because I wanted to shift the focus for this forum. Um, but we do calculate peak nesting numbers as well as keep track of the species that we saw so you can calculate richness and diversity. Um, peak nesting numbers are, are just basically um, at any given time, when were the most birds nesting in that colony? The first year, we only had three nesting colonies. Um, they started flying in January. We didn't see nesting until April. So um, these two are egrets. This one, I think, had like eight egrets in it. This had um, 330 birds, mostly cattle egrets. The next year <laughs> was a banner year for birds. I mean, we had the wood storks nesting on the sanctuary. We had one on bird rookery swamp. So half of these are wood stork colonies. Uh, we also see our three orange grove, cypresses, and sod farms. So they were nesting at those places last year, and, and they did it again the year. They did it the year previous, too. Um, not much to take from here. Sod Farms is a winner. Um, we had little blue parents, tricolor parents, and cattle egrets there, which was really awesome. This wood stork colony is a combination of um, great egrets and wood storks. So it's not just wood storks there. And roseates. Roseates the most. Um, species richness. This is the three nesting colonies from the first year that we went. Um, the two most um, specios, I guess, uh, colonies were what we call orange grove and sod farms. The orange grove is in an orange grove, 
um, and sod farms. Is it an area that's near a place that used to be sod farms? Not anymore, it's not true. But neither of these places would be considered excellent habitat. <laughs> we get a lot of diversity there. And it held true for the next year as well. Okay, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time, like I said, on the numbers because I did something really cool. I think it was really cool. <laughs> um, what I'm gonna show you are maps. They are not simply just pictures. I did not just put the dots on there. What I did was all of our numbers and data that, that we wrote down and put in a spreadsheet, took it all, I put it into the attributes table in ArcMap. And I used that data to look at how um, our foraging observations changed across the whole watershed with time. I did it for nesting and I did it for roosting as well. So, as I flip, I'm going to flip through these kind of quickly, but what I want you to look at is just how the dots move and change over the landscape. Um, I was going to see <laughs> if there was a difference between years, and I was doing this just for this presentation. Um, there wasn't much of a difference between years, so don't worry about the colors, just look at the dots. Um, you're probably going to see foraging uh, is pretty concentrated in the Cree Marsh. Then you start seeing foraging happen um, down there. Right. Alright, so cool, huh? Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> All right, um, we're seeing a lot of foraging happening up here and a lot of foraging happening here. There's a couple pockets down here, but that's because there's some water features there. We know that there's water here almost year round. Same with um, down in Bird Rookery as well. So I'm gonna do this for roosting as well. Um, you're probably, you're gonna see a slightly different pattern, but again, just look at the dots. Don't worry about the colors. <laughs> Okay, so typically we flew from November, well, the plan is to fly <laughs> from November to July. First year they didn't start until January. Um, and this year, well, we're, we're in February, so we haven't flown to July yet. But um, the neat thing here that I think is your roosting is not where they're foraging for the most part. They're in different spots <coughs> in the watershed. Okay. <coughs> okay, points. What kind of bird is this? Spoonbill. 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 Got it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I forget what my husband said he thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so nesting. Um, here you can pay attention to the colors if you want. We only had nesting in 2013 um, and nesting in, in 2014. We haven't detected any nesting yet this year. What you'll see is that most of the nesting is concentrated on the sanctuary property. Um, but there's going to be one up here and two down here. All right. All right. So this is the orange grove colony up here. That's the sod farms, right, Kathleen? Sod farm. And this one is the cypress east. So technically outside of our unit, but. Um, the first year, um, we weren't getting any nesting, so <laughs> she took what we could get even though it was outside. So <laughs> now, the majority of these are wood stork colonies, um, but we found that later on, after the wood storks had started, we started seeing where these boondolls come in and start nesting and breaking bits. So they're not entirely um, wood stork going on there. So I just want to sum it up. I really, really like this slide. <laughs> this slide sums up everything that, that we know so far to date. Um, again, we've got our foraging. Um, seems to be in the marsh and the northern part of the sanctuary. And the roosting is in the southern part. Typically, I think, where there's taller trees. And the nesting seems to be where they meet, where they overlap. You've got foraging, you have good trees for roosting, and you've got nesting. <coughs> Now some of the movement, I think that they start up here and move down for foraging. Some of that may also have to do with the nesting. It also may have to do with water levels. But we don't have very good water level data <laughs> to follow that up with. Now, 
this might look really simple to you, might look like a lot of dots, but every dot has an amazing table of information. Every dot has a time, has a location, it has every species of wading bird that we saw there and how many. And the really cool thing about ArcMap is we can do spatial analysis. We can now run time analysis to figure out whether great egrets are more commonly seen here or here, when, how many. So if we can do cluster analysis. Are they nearby to nesting colonies? Um, there's a lot of really, really cool stuff to do here. There's a ton of data, and we're just starting to look at it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs>